Today I depart from the usual sermon format of speaking about the sacred scriptures to talk to the whole parish on a matter of the greatest concern, somewhat in the manner of a father who admonishes his children, or like a school teacher who punishes the whole class for the misconduct of one. My general topic will be the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, but it will not be so much about the church's doctrine as about some practical matters. The immediate issue that has moved me to address you has to do with the recent discovery of three hosts, presumably consecrated, which were found at different times on the floor of our church. We don't know who did this terrible thing. I surely want to think that it's some outsider. But I want you to know that abuse of the Holy Eucharist is the most serious of sins. It's a sacrilege so grave that it cannot be absolved by a priest in confession. Rather, it's a sin reserved to the Pope himself to forgive, which is to say that it must refer to the Holy See. But I want to proceed quickly through a number of matters that relate to the reception of Holy Communion in a way that may strike you as pedantic or picayune, treating you as little children. And should you take it that way, I'm sorry. But given the choice between offending your sensitivities and offending the Lord by my neglect, your feelings would have to rate rather low. And so I have a list of Eucharistic issues to bring to your attention, and I wish you, you to observe them immediately. The first thing is to reiterate the Catholic teaching. You must all know that the Holy Eucharist of the Catholic Church means that this look-alike bread and seeming wine are the true living flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, God and man. They are not symbols of him, but the very real, physical, and divine reality of the living person of Jesus Christ. To receive Holy Communion, you must not only be a baptized Catholic, but you must also be in a state of grace. Should you have committed a mortal sin, of which there are many kinds, you may not receive communion, lest you commit a sacrilege and so condemn yourself to damnation. That is the teaching of St. Paul in God's infallible word, and no one can deny or change it. Confession is mandatory, obligatory. It is necessary before anyone who had been in mortal sin, may present himself for communion. Also, there's a required fast of merely one full hour from all food and drink before receiving the sacrament. You are not authorized to exempt yourself from this rule. Only water may be received before communion. Eating throat lozenges, drinking coffee, or chewing gum within the hour of communion time means that you cannot receive communion. Diabetics and other sick persons, however, are dispensed from this law if necessary. And speaking of eating and drinking, 
The church is not the place to be eating or drinking from your water bottles. If you have some special medical need, you should go out of the church proper and drink your needed water there. And the same applies to children. They are not to be fed pacifying snacks or drinks in the pews. Parents have the duty to discipline their children to stay put and be quiet in church. And should they cause a disturbance, they should be removed from the body of the church to the vestibule so that others won't be distracted in their concentration on the Mass. The proper dress code for church means that you should dress appropriately to appear before God. Holy Mass is not a casual affair, let alone a place for scanty summer wear. You should be fully covered, modestly concealing the human form, lest you be a scandal to others and an occasion of sin for them and an insult to the Lord himself. The sign that you believe that Jesus is truly present in the Holy Sacrament is to genuflect on your right knee upon entering and leaving the church. And also, should you cross the center of the church passing by the tabernacle. Our children should also be taught this, Put your right knee to the floor. There are many sacred moments in the Mass, but there's one that's most important. This is the moment of consecration, when the priest changes the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood and then raises the host and the chalice over his head to be seen and adored by you. This, above all, is a moment for you to keep silent and focused, not walking around the church, nor escorting your children to the toilet, nor fussing over anything, but riveting your attention on what's happening at the altar. The traditional thing to do is to look up at the host and the chalice when the priest holds them up, strike your breast, and to say silently, my Lord and my God. Now regarding receiving Holy Communion, I have several things to say. First of all, you should approach the communion railing with your hands folded not dangling at your sides. Your eyes should be downcast, not looking around in vain curiosity. You are going up to meet the Lord. Ladies with purses should carry them up with them as a matter of security. At the railing, only your folded hands should rest on the railing, not your arms or your elbows. If the communion cloth has been pulled, as it usually is for the Latin Mass, you should put your folded hands underneath this cloth. When the priest approaches you, there are a number of things for you to do at the same time. And first of all, close your eyes eyes. You should not look at the host as the priest tries to give it to you in Holy Communion. Otherwise, you're most likely to move your head and thus either snap at the priest's fingers or else to cause the host to drop. Tilt your head back slightly and open your mouth wide and, there's no other way to say this, Stick out your tongue. Don't think you're being impolite by putting your tongue out. And you don't need to make the sign of the cross after receiving communion, but it's not wrong to do so. 
you are not to bow or genuflect before receiving communion at the railing. Bowing or genuflecting are only to be done when communion is given to people who are standing. The fact that you're already on your knees means that you are adoring Christ in Holy Communion by that posture. In a Tridentine Latin Mass, you are not to say Amen upon receiving Communion because the priest himself says Amen as part of the prayer, he says. However, if it's a Mass in the new form, you should say Amen but before you receive the host on your tongue and not while the priest is trying to put the host on your tongue and certainly not afterward while the host is on your tongue. If the sacred host should fall, you shouldn't touch it. The priest knows what to do and he'll take care that no irreverence is done to the Lord. You should leave the rail soon after you receive communion and not delay there to cause a problem with the flow of communicants. With your eyes downcast and your hands folded once again, you should return to your pew and make your thanksgiving prayers there. Your thanksgiving may be made by covering your face in your hands, if you wish. This helps keep you from being distracted. But you are obliged to adore God in communion after receiving Him. I know this can be difficult to concentrate at this time. But your prayer time after communion is the most valuable for building up your spiritual union with our Lord. Now, regarding the sacrilege I spoke of, I want everyone in this parish to be on the lookout for anyone who takes the host out of his mouth and to report it as soon as possible to an usher or even better to one of us priests so that this person can be confronted immediately. And if you have the courage to do it yourself, you should speak up to this person. Please be vigilant for any suspicious movements at communion time. Now, I know I've given you a lot of directives about receiving communion. I don't expect you to remember all of them. And so I've asked the ushers to hand you a sheet with all these points on them as you leave Mass today so that you can review them at home. Our conduct at Mass, and especially our Eucharistic etiquette, if I may put it that way, ought to be impeccable, blameless, and indeed edifying to your fellow parishioners and to visitors to our church who may be used to a much more informal, mental, and physical manner of being at Mass. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar.